without further ado, we will have a panel with Will Henry. Will Henry is a filmmaker and writer, best known for producing and writing the documentary film, The High Frontier, The Untold Story of Gerald, Gerard K. O'Neill, which is what this panel will be about. Will is the creative director at Multiverse Media, a media group focused on space exploration, science, and technology. Just to give a little bit of intro, The High Frontier is a documentary film about the life and influence of Gerard K. O'Neill, told through the eyes of his peers, family, and the younger generation he inspired during the 1970s and 80s, who are now leaders in the modern day space race. Through old stories of Gary, as many, as Jerry, as many called him, and the social impact he made on the world, this documentary pays tribute to the unsung hero of today's space race, while hoping to inspire all ages and walks of life to reignite our planet's space venturing spirit. Hi, Will, how are you today? Hey, how you doing? I'm great, thanks for having me. Thank you. Let's start with you and give us a little bit of an intro for us and more of an insight on the documentary. Yeah, well, I think you kind of nailed all the things I would have said. So um, the information is already there, I think, in a way. But uh, yeah, my name is Will Henry. I was the writer and producer on The High Frontier, which just came out. It's now on um, Google Play, Fandango Now, Apple TV, all these other platforms as well. I'll put in the, uh, the chat. Um, it was a film that was um, executive produced and financed by Dylan Taylor of Voyager Space Holdings. Um, and uh, we, we uh, partnered with the team over at Subtractive in Santa Monica, California, which is a space... Um, production company. Um, it was a really awesome project. It took us about three years to make, um, and we got to do something that I think Jerry O'Neill would have been very proud of seeing after all this time, which was recreating some of the um, O'Neill cylinders um, in, in 3D animation that he, he uh, always wanted to see. Very much so, um, which is one of the things that I was going to talk to you about, which by the way, we have Lila Gislason, who is our co-founder at Cloud Nation with the Future, who will be joining us here for this panel. Um, as I mean, I've watched this documentary and I actually have it on Apple TV. Um, and I was, as I was watching it, one of the things that caught my eye immediately or what made me ponder was how much he probably would have been fascinated with just how much his influence has spread on not just the, um, the people who are in the industry for space, but also many people who are space enthusiasts as well who see this and think to themselves, wow, like my children could probably live on this. This is, much, this is a reality. Fortunately, he didn't get to see the advancements that we are or where we are today, but putting that out in the format that you did in the documentary was not only compelling, but actually really, really, really beautiful. Thank so you. how was it that you um, came about doing that? <laughs> well, there's a lot of answers. Um, and, and you're right. I think it's very, it's a little bit of a tearjerker to realize that Jerry will never get to see these because he, he passed in 1992. Um, but he sacrificed a lot to make today possible. Um, and I think in a lot of respects, we may not even be sitting here without his influence. Um, a lot of the people who run the industry now are so-called Jerry's kids. Um, and those are people who were initially inspired to work in the space industry by Gerard O'Neill, um, spent their entire life creating uh, either private capital or new businesses or, or were inventors, scientists, what have you, uh, media people like myself, um, to go out there and create this vision of the future that would allow private citizens to succeed in space. And that's exactly what's happening. So um, I think he'd be very, in the words of Frank Way, I think he'd be very I, we're, we're sorry he's missed it because it's really exciting. Um, but the, the process of getting to doing it, I mean, there's a lot of answers for that. I think that, you know, we went through many, 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 many hoops to get this film made. Um, but I think the, 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 the common denominator of all of it was that this film would not have existed without the O'Neill family, the estate. They opened all the doors for us to be able to speak with all the people who are in the film. Um, and uh, many people, we, they also provided things like his um, unheard of and unpublished autobiography um, and things that just the world had never seen and, and didn't know existed. Um, and, and the film really exists because of, of the doors they opened for us and allowed us to, to do. And then we just took the money and invested it in, in, in smart ways and making it entertaining to watch too. 
Yeah, very much so. Like when I was watching it, it was interesting to see um, how um, back in the day, people who were not just specifically in the industry, but also people who were fanatics of at the time, like they were huge fans of uh, sci-fi and whatnot, and how they were looking at this and thinking the things that I'm seeing on TV could happen in my lifetime. And very much so, I think that that's what um, we're doing at this moment is we're talking about that, but none of that would have been possible without his amazing influences and what he was able to do at his time, even though he thought at some point I was watching it, he said that um, um, what he would like pretty much everything could have been possible in the late eighties. And that obviously did not happen. And now we're talking about the near term future and the advancements that we could do, which are every day now in this day and age, every year, I mean, even just like every other day or so we're watching the news and we're seeing bigger and better advancements because of um, how, I guess, like all of these ideas that we have, you know, and none of that, a lot of that wouldn't have been possible without his help, without what he did. Um, so can you elaborate a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, you're absolutely right. I don't think we would be where we were, where we are today without that inspiration. It's definitely, that definitely resonates in the movie. Um, I also think that, you know, um, he, he knew that it was gonna be private citizens who either made this happen or brought it to the government to make it happen. Um, and yeah, he definitely thought it was gonna happen by the eighties, but that was also with a lot of caveats. Um, he knew that it likely would not happen by, by the 1980s. It was, it was more of if everything, if the government did backflips to get this done, then yeah, maybe we might've seen it in the, in the 1980s. But I, I just, he, he knew it wouldn't happen. But he did think that, you know, by, by today, 2021, that we'd at least have one up there, that we'd at least have one of those O'Neill cylinders up there. Um, and I think he'd be a little disappointed that it hasn't happened, but I also know that he was a very practical person. Um, he was a little bit of a romantic at times, but he was a very practical person um, and knew that things like this were going to happen, that there was going to be a pause for NASA. There was going to be... Um, political issues that got in the way of him achieving these these ideas which were really hard to sell on on on, on the masses i mean you <laughs> you listen to some of the um the uh interviews that didn't make the movie um and there was a, a hard religious line that also didn't want him to get this done and it was pretty incredible that that was a major portion of 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 the political uh nature of of the country at the time too um which is why he went out and tried to get japan to, to get this done um so yeah, I mean, I'm not sure I'm quite answering the question perfectly, but you know, he, a lot of people look at, the reason we made the film was that we had heard about Jerry O'Neill. We knew about the books, we knew about his legacy, but a lot of people didn't. And then um, I wasn't invited to this, but my boss was invited to the SpaceX, uh, the, the booster landings, the first time he did the dual landings. Um, and he was there and he, he looked around and he realized that, you know, a lot of these people probably didn't know who Jerry O'Neill was. And he realized he needed to go out there and show that the future of space exploration and, and space business and space manufacturing um, doesn't start today. It didn't start with SpaceX. It didn't start with Blue Origin. It started, you know, even before Jerry, but Jerry is an iconic part of that journey that people don't know about. Um, and we realized we just we had to, to make a movie about it. Yeah, very much. So one of the things that um, captivated me was his resilience. Like you said, you know, what he what he was willing to do to make this a reality. And another thing that I really like, oh, what's that, Michael? Oh, that's a, <laughs> perfect. Yeah, so, and, it's, and another, it's, the, it's the Bible that started everything. <laughs> it is. Yeah, a lot of people call it the, uh, the like the handbook or the Bible for space. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, space manufacturing, space business. Space we, we, I, it hasn't had a cover. I don't know. I don't know if I ever had a cover for it. But, uh, you know, um, uh, Musk and Bezos and about a dozen other people uh, reference it as as kind of that that must read book that kind of starts everything, um, and you know the two people that I kind of credit that personally got me into space, uh, uh, Tomlinson and Diamandis, uh, you know they they 
they were there when at the very beginning. So it's just kind of amazing to see how this has transpired. But you know, the, your point about not everybody knows who, where our foundations were 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 crafted. I, I think that's kind of important. I, that's why one of the reasons why we wanted to have, uh, join us today. Um, I understand you've got a bit of a presentation. Do you have some show and tell for us? I do. Yeah, I can jump right into that. Um, two quick little things I can add to what you just said, by the way. The Please, book yeah, you please. have, um, the book you have, uh, if you had the cover, that thing would be worth a lot of money because um, the cover is the original first edition, the one with like the really beautiful Rick Giddis, uh yeah. artwork. Um, if it's in good condition, that thing's worth a lot of money. That's the one I have. Although mine's worth more for a different reason. <laughs> um, I have this. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I think I do have the cover. I just don't think it's on my shelf because I referenced it a lot. Yeah. Um, but I, I actually got his wife to sign it, and she was she blushed when I asked. I'm like, she's like, I didn't write it. I'm like, <laughs> I know, but you were there in the beginning, and and he died before I was even aware of this stuff, so. I mean, uh, I've got it. I've got it signed for the like the wrong person, but for the right reasons. So yeah, she was yeah. there every step of the way. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Credit where it's due, right? Yeah, um, and when I mentioned that the movie would not exist without the family, that's entirely true. But I'd say a large, large, large portion of that was was the widow Tasha O'Neill. Um, nice. But um, and then the second thing I just wanted to say real quick was you mentioned that Diamandis and Tomlinson got you kind of you know started I forget what you, it started move, uh, got you moving in this industry. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's really cool to watch the movie too because um, there's photos of Jerry and in the background you can see like a young Peter Diamandis holding like the High Frontier, <laughs> kind of like going through like a conference and you'll never notice that unless you stop the movie on every single frame. Um, but that was sort of the the passion of making this movie was was I, putting all those. Easter eggs in there. You can't see, but I I wear I only wear two pins. One Space Frontier Foundation, the other one's ISU. So there you go. Uh, those are my roots. There you go. Well, here, yeah, I'll jump right in. Um, let me just make sure. I want to make sure I'm gonna uh, share my screen correctly because I have a few screens here. Yeah, no problem. And um, also, while we wait for Will Michael, you can go and look for the original cover. Yeah, I, I really, yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's not like I was selling y'all don't know but I have probably 50 signed books behind me I, I'm a I'm a big nerd that's my one that's my one uh collection that I really actively pursue is, you can is signed donate, books by space nerds so you can donate this the proceeds from your auction to foundation <laughs> <for the> future <laughs> there you go <laughs> yeah, we should. Oh, this looks this looks fabulous well whenever you're ready to present yeah, absolutely. Not a problem. Um, so we kind of went over a few little bits here, but really, um, you know, I, I mentioned I'm the writer and the producer of the film. I'll tell you um, a little bit more about the rest of the team later. Um, uh, this presentation will give you a little bit of background on who Jerry was, his story. Um, the original presentation that Layla saw um, when I did this was a little bit different. It had a little bit more of the deep dive into the stuff we didn't even make into the movie, but for time, I won't. Um, I can direct you to places to go find that. Um, but uh, the other thing is I actually ended up being able, I was able to go through our archives in the, in, over the weekend um, and I found some clips of Jerry speaking about space solar power and how um, this idea would have helped achieve space solar power. So I have a clip of all that. It looks awful just because it's from the archives, but well, I'll show you that as well. But here's our poster, obviously. Um, so there's a whole story of Jerry O'Neill's life before we got to this point here at Princeton in 1969. Um, there's a book about every, his whole life, and I'll, I'll talk about that later, but the story that I want to focus on and what the movie focuses on um, starts in 1969 in, uh, at Princeton University, where ironically I grew up. Um, so uh, this was a time, it was the Vietnam War, it was a time when physicists were, were relatively vilified for the evils of war. Um, and so uh, Jerry frequently would try to teach physics, the physics, his students that physics could be used for good and not necessarily for evil. Um, and so one of the things he did, though, was actually he had a, a focus group where you would ask students who were performing a little bit faster than the rest of the class questions that were a, a bit far reaching, things that were almost things that he wanted to research he just didn't have the time for. Um, and he would put uh, his students on those problems. And one of those problems was, or rather one of those questions that he asked them to work on, um, was very topical. We just landed on the moon. Um, we were thinking about 
branching out and, and maybe setting up shop on, on another uh, terrestrial surface. Um, and he asked a question that a lot of people associate with Gerard O'Neill, which is um, considered having changed the world, I, I think, but also changing the uh, future of space industry, but also everyone in his life and his career, which was that, is the surface of a planet the right place for an expanding technological civilization? So um, the students, and rather, by the way, what he was sort of implying there was, is there a better place than being on planets? Is there a way that we can make habitats or, or communities or places in space. Um, and, and this was a, a, a bubbling idea at the time. So he really wanted to look into the, the first principles of physics and figure out if there was a better place. And they took a few weeks to look at it and came back and the answer was no. Living, uh, setting up shop basically on, on, on the surface of a planet was actually not the best place to do it. And, fr and quite frankly, we'd probably run out of money before we got the ability to do another one. Um, he, so after some research, he you know, built this whole compendium of how this would work. He tried to get it published for years and finally did in Physics Today in 1974, uh, September 1974. And this is the first article. And for a lot of people in the movie, you'll see that. Um, and by the way, I think there's a few people on this call today who are in the movie, which is really fun. Um, Rick Tumlinson, who I think may be joining us later. Um, and then uh, I think I saw Al Globus and Gary Olson. Um, they're both in the movie. Um, so on the left here, you'll see uh, what his first kind of mock-up was for, and it's definitely not done by him. He was a terrible artist. <laughs> he, he was a mathematician. Um, and so uh, this was the original color version of it. And on the right was actually one of the slides he would use on his presentations. I found this in uh, his home in Princeton. Um, and it, it was sort of like a, a cutaway of how the math and physics of it would, would sort of work. And there's a lot more of these that I can share with you guys later. Um, but here's how, if you haven't heard about these, if you have, uh, stay tuned, but if you haven't, it, the, the functionality of these would be that we would put these, we would uh, put them in places called the Lagrangian points. These are stable gravitational points between the earth and moon. Um, and the most popular ones were L4 and L5. Um, ironically, that's I mean, not ironically, that's where they came up with the L5 society. Um, and there would be uh, two of them in space at a time, and they would be connected by these thin white lines you see on, on the, uh, the bottom of the left photo here. Um, they would rotate about three times a minute to create Earth normal gravity. There would be mirrors which would reflect sunlight. Um, we will see that there's these uh, these mirrors stick. Those are the mirrors that are sticking out there. There's three land areas and three glass uh, rather window areas. Um, and then the uh, large size would be uh, large enough to create enough scattering to replicate the blue skies of Earth. Um, it would be filled with breathable air. Um, they would be uh, uh, having agricultural pods, this actual white sort of orb you see on the right side of the photo is the agricultural pod. Um, so they would be able to have crops much like we do here on Earth, but they could also control the weather and the time of day so they could grow crops a lot faster. Um, the other part that was obviously big and important for today is that uh, these would include uh, space solar power panels, which would face the sun and absorb endless energy. Um, so that's actually this brass donut you see on the back. Um, here and that would of course power the the, the station itself. Um, but then a lot of the excess um, power would be, uh, and I'm not sure if this is how it's done or what the idea is that this is how it'd be done today. But back in the day, is that it would be sent back to the Earth using microwaves, um, and there would be almost no loss of, of power in, in, in sending it. And then we'd be able to use it here on Earth. And if you had enough of these, you know, then that would be a, a viable industry to to invest in. Um, so obviously, it would change zero. It would change activities, sports. A lot of the, 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 the goal for some, some people was to actually make this a place for people who were elderly. Once we were able to actually build these and replicate them financially uh, soundly, getting people up there who had um, either uh, uh, ailments or illnesses or, or if they had bad backs or, or they were just elderly, we could put them in places with lower gravity, with lower gravity and they'd be able to, um, uh, people believe they would be able to live longer, but also they just have a better uh, 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 lifestyle because of the, the, uh, the lower pressure on their bodies. Um, but obviously, I mean, this would change sports. This would change a lot of things. You could have human powered flight. There's books written on this stuff. You can go find it. I'm sure you've seen it before. It's really fun. Um, the size would also, uh, uh, made the major um, thing people said why this wasn't, wouldn't work is because of the cosmic rays, but he was able to pr prove with math that that was not going to be a problem given the, the density and thickness of the shell. Um, and then the initial idea that he had was, would be that these would hold tens of thousands of people, but it, would, it was even by today's standards, we're thinking even millions. Blue Origin is thinking millions, because as you'll see later, that's the direction of where that company's 
heading at the moment. So these are some more artistic mock-ups. I'm sure you've seen them all before. Um, there's a lot more in the movie that you, I don't want to ruin them for you here, but there's a lot more in the movie that you haven't seen before. So please go see it. Um, even ones that were drawn by Jerry himself. Um, so uh, actually real quick before I get there, the uh, there's sort of like a, a how, there's two important parts here. There's a how and a why. Um, I'm going to leave the how for you to go see the movie and see see how this would be done because there was a lot of what really got people's attention was that this was doable. This was a viable option. We could do it. There was no new physics needed to be invented. There's no new uh, leaps and bounds that we had to get to that wasn't available today. And that was today in 1974, five, six. Um, so obviously we still have that uh, today, but that, I'll leave that for the movie, but the, it was more about the why for, for what I'm gonna talk about today. And so there were five main things that he realized he could help alleviate on earth and, and realized that we would um, rather we would hit our limits to growth, which was a, a, a you know, the, the club of Rome topic at the time, which was that, uh, uh, we would hit a limit to growth and, and we as a species would, would struggle to survive and may end up imploding in a, in a, in a metaphorical sense. Um, so what it would help obviously alleviate is overpopulation. You make more land area, you make more places for people to live. Um, it would also alleviate, uh, the, 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 um, the hunger on planet earth um, it would also help with dwindling resources and energy obviously space solar power being a big part of that um, it would have it would help with climate change and all of these would help alleviate the effects of, of war jerry really believed that by doing this we would um, see a future where wars would maybe just be too too costly to even to even have and you know i me as a practical person i'm not sure that that would have been as achievable as he thought it would be but it's a really beautiful vision to look forward to and it's hopeful and who knows um, so uh, he was frequently quoted as saying, opening the high frontier means making possible and ensuring the survival of the human race. And I really believe that that 100% is true. And two, if Jerry didn't say that, we may not be living in a hopeful future that we are today. Um, and I'm really, really uh, thankful for that. Um, so now I have a video of all those archive footage of, of, of him speaking about solar power um, and how it would work with, the, with the, his, his, his cylinders. Um, so, Please excuse the bad sound and any of the time code you'll see here, but enjoy. A program once at the level of producing a couple of satellite power stations per year would not stop there. We would uh, then upgrade the manufacturing capability up to the point eventually of being able to satisfy all of the world's needs for low cost, clean electrical power. This is a, a cylinder which uh, is, has its axis pointing toward the sun always. That would be a solar power satellite. And this is one of the great big things I spoke about that might weigh as much as a big ocean liner, but could be built in space. Uh, make sure once you get it there, what it weighs, right? That's right, that's right. So uh, we calculated, in fact, that a program like that, uh, if all the study reports and so on do hold up as they seem to be, could even be supplying in a very clean way um, practically all of the energy we would need within another few decades. Absolutely fascinating. And maybe even to build solar power satellites, which would, if they work out, if they are economically competitive, supply the entire Earth with clean and free and reliable solar energy. What about the source of energy in space? It's the free energy of the sun, that nuclear reactor conveniently placed for us nearly 100 million miles away. The sunlight in the form that comes out in space is constant, and very, very powerful. And when a space colony is set up in the proper way, the sun is always in the same location relative to it, so that not just in the vicinity of the Earth, but much farther out in the solar system, it's possible to have light gathering mirrors which can produce the same solar intensity that we have here at the distance that the Earth is from the sun. So we can provide our energy uh, at any location that we like within the solar system, even as far out as the planet Pluto and beyond. Great. So obviously things started taking off for him um, in those mid seventies. And there's a lot of factors that got him to end up writing the book, The High Frontier. Um, but in 1976, he, well, it was the end of 1976, 1977, he released um, The High Frontier, which was basically, um, there's a few really important parts about that. 
Um, but really what it was, was a mathematical, it, it was simple mathematics and physics for everyday people to see how we could do this and convince them to take this seriously. Um, it was also filled with a lot of fictional accounts of what it would have been like to be one of those people going up there and either building or being a part of it or coming there and back and uh, going back and forth. Um, and what it'd be like to, you know, grow a family in, in space. Um, and I don't mean grow in, to, I mean, grow in, as a family and have, you know, children. <laughs> um, and so uh, this book, however, was really the, 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 the thing that, that started it all. A lot of people started picking up this book. And, I'll, and, and if you talk to anyone who was inspired by him at any point, they either had the book, they either were, were given the book or they bought the book and it changed their lives forever. What's really awesome about this book is that it still holds up today. Um, and we actually just released a new edition of it, which I'll get to it later. But um, you can still read this book and it's still, it, it's the same mathematics, physics and, and vision that companies like Blue Origin are using today. So I highly recommend you read it. And in the words of Jim Muncy, Anyone can read the book. It'll change their, uh, it'll change the way they look at space forever. And I highly recommend if you haven't to go read it. Um, so right after that, you know, he held some space manufacturing conferences and those were a, a really awesome time. And I wish I had time to talk about them too, but I, I don't. Um, uh, but what was really important was that someone showed up to one of those conferences from the New York Times, published them on the front page of the New York Times. And uh, it really changed everything for them overnight. They had to disconnect their phone. They had to change their phone number and really just put him into the limelight. And at the time, a lot of major shows brought him on. And it was really fun. He was on Beyond 2000. He was on Johnny Carson, Carson 60 Minutes. He was on uh, In Search of with Leonard Nimoy. He was on PBS Nova. Um, he was on Larry King's radio show in like the first couple of years, which was really cool. Um, and then obviously he was in, in print all over the world. And I think we had something like 500 plus print pieces to work with um, when we made the film and we only ended up using like 35, but we could have just put so many. Um, and this was really important time for him too, because um, he was not only a worker on this, he was an activist um, and he, he endlessly worked with grassroots campaigns. He worked with the government. He was on the National Committee of Space under Reagan. Um, and he was giving talks all around the world at universities and on news channels and, and even in other languages. Um, but most importantly, around this time, he founded the Space Studies Institute. Um, and he founded it with his wife at the time in Princeton. And it was really to bring the masses of people who now looked up to him to work on this together, to prove to government and to, to private citizens with, with financial capital that this could be done. Um, and so uh, uh, this is sort of where the story really kind of explodes. And, and so I think it's a good time for me to also now show you the trailer. So we'll jump right back into another video. If you haven't seen it, um, I, I, I hope it inspires you. places in space. Do you really believe we can be there soon? With the technology that we have now, we could do it and maybe by the late 1980s. Talking about outer space and colonizing outer space is always intriguing. And here's a gentleman who knows about it. Would you welcome please Gerard K. O'Neill. O'Neill rolls out this book called High Frontier that shows how to do it. Step by step. And it's go time. Anyone can read the book. That will change how you think about space forever. It's possible to make uh, habitats which are relatively big, big enough to be very Earth-like. Ninety percent of people on Earth in a hundred years would move out into space. Later, we call the Earth the old country. <laughs> Jerry O'Neill asked, "Is a planetary surface the right place for an expanding industrial civilization?" The episode of human life being confined to Earth is coming to an end. Space will be the next civilization. Industries and colonies in space may sound incredible, but we who are working toward them know that most of the building blocks are already in place. 
Jerry O'Neill is a physicist with a brilliant reputation among his colleagues. O'Neill might have stayed in that abstract world, but he has always been intrigued by space. Jerry had a dream of going into space, and he went through the whole program, all the rigorous, grueling uh, physical and psychological tests. I was really worried that O'Neill's influence and his greatness has not been publicly understood but then if somebody with the wherewithal of jeff bezos actually tries to implement it that's transformational it's this generation's job to build that road to space professor o'neill was very formative for me i read the high frontier in high school and as soon as i read it it made sense to me space isn't just something that's just the engineers show up to you know this is something for for artists and and writers and business people we were a bunch of young intuitive punks we're all jerry's kids we're all in one way or another caught up in this idea three two one go. yes it was crazy yes it was science fiction yes it was way out there but the steps were there it just was hard work and all of us were willing to do the hard work we you and i are the only people who will ever have the privilege of saying we explored the solar system first this concept is so enormous in its scale and the change of human events that's going to happen inevitably as a result of this it's very important that it be about everybody that we stay true to jerry's vision we're all jerry's kids and that's something to be excited by and a legacy that we can all live in so. life is extraordinarily rare extraordinarily precious opening the high frontier means making possible and ensuring the survival of the human race Okay, so in wrapping up here, um, so this was our team. Um, as I mentioned, Dylan of Voyager was um, our executive producer. Um, and then the two gentlemen below on in, in uh, black and white were uh, for Subtractive and, uh, Inc., who are uh, the space company I mentioned in Santa Monica. Uh, they were our director, editor, and producer, as well as myself. Um, we had an incredible, obviously I've already mentioned this, but we had an incredible lineup of people in the movie. Um, we had people, Eager to, like I said, we had to have a lot of doors open to, to speak to some, some of these people. But once we did, we had people doing backflips to also be in the movie. Um, and if you, obviously I mentioned some people are also uh, in, in, in this chat are also in the movie. Um, but if you know, you know, I'm sure you know half the people on this list, you gotta watch the movie just for that, for that part, watching them talk about their hero. Because a lot of the people who, everyone in the movie pretty much took on their career because of the inspiration of Jerry O'Neill. Um, and so it was a really nice testament to have them all come back together for that. Um, a few quick highlights about the, the, the making of this movie. Um, we have thousands of hours of archive footage from friends, family, universities, museums, studios, and um, even literally from the trash. We found things in the trash. <laughs> um, uh, we went, went through a, a thousand magazines and books that were, uh, that were uh, we were told mentioned Jerry O'Neill. We went page by page looking through them. We bought old tape decks and out of commission video devices just to watch old videos we thought might have content um, of Jerry and many of them did not, but some of them did. Um, we uh, went through hundreds of hours of radio talk shows, speeches and new recordings uh, were listened to and digitized. We also um, uh, had about a thousand beyond repair slides. We were told they were beyond repair, um, but we, we were able to refurbish them for the movie. Um, we also digitized, this was really fun because people don't like, um, a lot of times, a lot of uh, artists don't like their work being altered. Um, and we got permissions from Don Davis, Rick Gittes, Robert McCall, Ron Miller, Pat Rawlings, and many more to take their work use in the movie and animate it, um, which is relatively unheard of, but yet again, another testament to, to their inspiration of O'Neill. Um, and then we also commissioned two well-known 3D artists to create fly-through animations of being in an O cylinder, which I wish Jerry could have seen. Um, and then uh, just a quick last moment here, uh, Less I mentioned here is that O'Neill's writing and vision still holds up. I mentioned that before. Um, it really does. Please go read The High Frontier. I think you'll find it incredibly inspirational. Um, and it's just as relevant as, as it was then as it is today. 
Um, and we call this a dust to diamonds project at, for the, all the reasons that I just listed there. Um, we took trash literally and made it into a really beautiful tearjerker movie. <laughs> um, but however, I do think that, you know, of, of all of Jerry's achievements, the one that was the, the, the greatest achievement um, was his Jerry's kids. And those are the, uh, uh, the people who spent their younger lives, uh, Rick included in this, um, younger lives inspired by uh, Jerry O'Neill followed him and then decided to take on their careers and build their uh, so-called empires and, and study their fields of expertise for the dream of making his vision a reality and, and almost all of them have um, and they they all uh, uh, call themselves Jerry's kids myself included in that so um, it's now available on these five platforms it will be available um, on Amazon in the, the coming months they're having a really fun issue with our movie. So hopefully you'll see it there soon. Um, but the best and easiest places to find it are on, on iTunes, Apple TV, and uh, Google Play. Um, we also released, released two books along with the movie. The one on the left here is the, uh, the, the original, The High Frontier. This is the movie edition copy. Um, it's, it's the actual third edition inside, um, but we rebranded it with our own um, artwork from the film. Um, and then the book on the right actually was written by our executive producer, Dylan Taylor. This is um, the full life story of O'Neill. Um, like I said, there was so much about his early life that we couldn't include. And that's, you know, things like his childhood, his time in the Navy, um, and then his journey to becoming a world-class physicist. He was up for a Nobel prize um, and uh, all the way through uh, the high frontier era and onto his passing in 19... 92. Um, both of these are in our merch store, which I'll, I'll put a link to in the chat bar here. Um, also, here's some really cool swag if you want to go get some cool shirts, hats, cups, um, jackets, sweaters, even uh, the film poster. Um, they're all really awesome. I have all of them. And uh, by the way, you can get 10% off if you want um, using the code Frontier. I'll also put that in the chat. Um, and then here's some helpful links. Top link will give you everything. That's the merch. That's the uh, links to the film. Um, and, and then about the, the filmmakers and the people in the film, High Frontier merch, obviously that's where you can go get them. Um, and then you can follow us on all social media handles using at High Frontier Doc. Um, and that is the end of my story. I'll turn it over to Rick. <laughs> that is so amazing. <laughs>